Hello and welcome to episode 157 of the Story Stream. My name is Mr. Gerald and I am here with you today not to write a story as we usually do, but rather to celebrate the winter solstice. Yes, it is December 21st. The sun rose this morning at 721, I believe. Yeah, the sun rose at 721. We'll be setting in a mere 23 minutes, making this the shortest day of the year and also a cause for celebration in many places of the world. I looked into it. Uh, something I got to take part in many years ago was the St. Lucia celebration, which is something uh, celebrated in Scandinavia. When I celebrated it, it, I believe it was with a Norwegian family. There is also a Shabi Yalda in Iran, an ancient Persian tradition. In Japan, they celebrate Toji, which I discovered Recently, they celebrate by putting yuzu fruit into hot springs. If you've ever seen a picture of a capybara in a hot spring with a citrus fruit on its head, that's where that picture comes from, which is strange to me because capybaras are not from Japan. I guess it was a zoo. Also, the Hopi people of uh, the Hopi of northern Arizona uh, celebrate soyal, and it's it's a. It did make me think, though. Everyone celebrating the return of the longer days and I don't know if I'm 100% into a vilifying night I think in a lot of ways you could say uh, that you know night is grossly underappreciated and even now with so many street lights everywhere and everyone on devices constantly uh, night Seems more precious than ever. So I'm not celebrating, um, well, I'm celebrating both. I'm celebrating our days getting longer, but also celebrating the wonderful, beautiful, long night we're gonna have tonight. I have a few stories, actually. Um, celebrating night. But let's do this. Let's go right now to some Christmas stories. Syra, you made it. I'm so happy to see you. You're just in time. I imagine a few people might be trickling in. I'm going to uh, pull up my box of Christmas books and go through them for a little and wait to see who else hops online. Uh, and then I'll get to the story that I've prepared to share. It's so good to see you uh, on here. It's rare for me to have anyone viewing at all. So to have, have I can see my counter says two viewers, which is... Um, Two more than I usually have. And it's not even an indication of everyone who could be watching. Mark, thank you. Happy solstice to you and to Annika. Oh, it's such a treat to have you here. Uh, I'm going to open this box in a moment and we're going to look at some Christmas and other holiday books. But speaking, as I did, of Scandinavia a few minutes ago, let's see if I can find in here this one. This is The Tomten by Astrid, Ling Astrid Lindgren, famous for... The Pippi Longstocking books, of course. But this is a gorgeous book. Um, you'll see the illustrator isn't credited at all on here. It's Harold Viberg. Um, we can see there. Let me see if I can get this focused a little better. That's worse. And the Tompton is a story of this winter spirit who visits a farm and speaks to all the creatures.
and it's really uh, just an absolutely beautiful book. He visits everyone in the house and then returns to his home. But, you know, speaking of celebrating night, uh, this entire story takes place in one evening, and it's lovely. Um, I add here, I haven't looked in this book in a couple of years, actually. This is Babar and Father Christmas. This was, um, yeah. So the Babar books are often credited, credited to Jean and Laurent de Brunoff, um, Jean was the father. This was the last story he wrote before he died, actually. It was written as a series of... It was written as a series of uh, newspaper... No, magazine um, stories. But they were compiled after his death and turned into this book. Uh, his son, who took up the mantle of creator of the Babar stories, uh, colored this front illustration... He was only 16 at the time. Hello, Ford. Thanks for joining. It's good to see you here. Yeah, but then he would go on to write many other Babar stories. Um, while we're in France, there's this book. Father Christmas, The Truth. This is a French book. I'm holding... Hey, Jason. So good to see you. Yay. It feels like Christmas now. And uh, Jason is our resident Norwegian. He can tell me if he's ever seen a Tomten. This book is the UK English adaptation of the Father Christmas book. Oh, it's the story of Father Christmas. I believe there's an American adaptation, I think, published by Chronicle Books. And it, maybe it says Santa Claus. I wouldn't know. Uh, Father Christmas, the truth. But I do want to show you just a couple in here. I'm going to tread carefully through this book because it's, it's uh, very French, meaning there's a bit of um, colonialist attitudes in it. So I'm going to scoot ahead, avoid anything objectionable. I'd also be interested to know if the American one uh, scrubbed it clean of that kind of thing. There we go. This is the page I was looking for. Father. Father Christmas's father is very proud of his son. Look at this guy. This is, if you've ever wondered what Father Christmas's father looks like, Grandfather Christmas, that's him. It's, it's actually very fun. Oh, yeah, good. I'm glad I found that page. Unrecognizable. If he shaved his beard off, Father Christmas would be unrecognizable and would probably frighten the elves. I imagine he would. All right, shall I dip further into the uh, bin? Anyone interested in some more? This is a great, great, great Christmas book. Mr. Willoughby's Christmas Tree. Um, it's, it's so, so charming. The pictures are great. I love the cartoon drawings. Uh, pen and ink with a single spot color, just some green. Let me zoom out just a touch more. Uh, but it's a story of Mr. Willoughby's Christmas tree, which doesn't fit his room. So there they are getting the tree. It doesn't fit into his parlor. You can see the top is bent. So they trim it off, of course, and throw it out. Well, actually, no, it goes to the maid who uh, doesn't fit in her room. So she trims it down, throws it out, and it goes to, uh, let's see, Tim, the gardener, who takes it home. And of course, it doesn't fit in his house, and so he throws the tip out, et cetera, et cetera. And this tree makes, it way, makes its way across um, the entire community. And I will not spoil the ending because if you get a chance to read it, it's, it's, it's so good, so good. Ford loves that book. Don't shave the beard off. Terrible. What do you mean? Well, uh, yeah, yeah. I will, I will uh, relegate that to the back of the bin. What else do I have? Oh, this was a gift from uh, my co-author, Julie Danielson. It's another French import, The Christmas Feast. 
about a very clever turkey who outwits some predators. And then this one, those of you who know me know I'm a big uh, fan and advocate of independent presses. And this is a book. Look, check out the gold foil on there. Can you see that? Mr. Dog's Christmas. Mr. Dog's Christmas at the Hollow Tree Inn by Albert Bigelow Payne, illustrated by Adam McCauley. And it's, it has a great vintage feel about this. But I don't know, um, I bought this in Berkeley about five years ago. I'm not sure when it was published though. 2014, so that adds up. Um, it has such a great vintage feel about it. Illustration, text, story, everything. But it's, I'm not certain how you can find this if you were interested in finding it. Hello, Brenna, thank you for joining. It's wonderful to see you. We're just going through my collection of books right now, Christmas books, Christmas and holiday and winter books um, before we get started with the story to see who else joins. Aha. Kangaroo for Christmas by James Flora. Now James Flora was a designer. Um, I, I, I get, I'm not sure what you would call it, uh, modern or if it was animation, it'd be called the UP st uh, UPA style. Uh, but it's kind of like a mid-century modern, and you might recognize it as a kind of thing you'd see. He was a commercial artist, but he branched into kids' books uh, later in his career. And this is his Kangaroo for Christmas, which I love for many reasons. Among them, this, the pages alternate between color, and each, each page just has this uh, blue, brown, and pink. And, you know, muted blue, light brown, and a dusky pink. But the, the pages alternate. They go color, black, and white. Color, black and white. I think in this page especially you can see that. Um, this probably looks exactly like a commercial you'd see back in the 60s, you know, advertising laundry detergent or some such. It's so good. I need to find more of his books. This is actually the only Jim, James Flora book I own. Kangaroo for Christmas. I see my viewer count is um, increasing steadily. Thank you so much. If, um, if, if you're anyone I know, if, even if you're not, say hello in the chat. I'd be very glad to greet you. Uh, what Christmas collection would be complete without this, of course? Um, Crockett Johnson's Herald at the North Pole. Clifford's creator, Norman Bridwell. The Witch's Christmas. I paid a full 50 cents for that. All right, I think actually in a moment we'll move on. You all have made, made, made my solstice. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. And I hope, I hope um, this is interesting to you. Um, I'll just dig down to the bottom here. Petunia's Christmas. Brian Wildsmith, The Twelve Days of Christmas. Some lovely art in there. And then this one, which I actually bought for a dollar. Hello, is that Oscar I see just joining? Thank you for joining, Oscar. Uh, Babushka and the Three Kings, because it's a Caldecott winner. It's possible it's an honor book, but um, Babushka and the Three Kings. I saw it for a dollar, picked it up, but I haven't yet read it. Maybe I'll do treat myself this year. But we are here not to read these books, but rather to share one uh, that I made last year, uh, almost a full year ago, in fact. For those of you who don't know, I've been doing this story stream for about a year and a half now. I started back in July 2020. And last year, on December, hey, Brenna loves Petunia, great. Daryl's here for the presents. Your, your presence is my present. Uh, but you will maybe get a treat towards the end of the broadcast. Um, last year, almost one year ago exactly, it was December 22nd. Um, oh, so on every episode, I pull some random words and I write a story based on those words. Last year on December 22nd, I wrote a story that turned out to be 
a Christmas story. I thought I might like to share that with you today, and I will. But before I do, I want to give a little bit of background on it because this story fulfilled um, another um, long-held desire of mine, and that was this. There's a book called The Big Orange Splot by Daniel Pinkwater, pictured here, levitating in his driveway in New Jersey, um, photographed by his wife, Jill Pinkwater. Daniel Pinkwater writes, has written many uh, books for children, and this one might be one of his most famous, and I'll tell you, it might be, I think, uh, it might deserve a place in the top 10, maybe even the top five picture books of all time. But in this story, The Big Orange Splot, Luke, <laughs> in this story, Mr. Plumbeam lived on a street where all the houses were the same. He liked it that way. So did everybody else on Mr. Plumbeam Street. This is a neat street, they would say. Then one day, all right, now listen closely here. A seagull flew over Mr. Plumbeam's house. He was carrying a can of bright orange paint. No one knows why. And that mystery, that mystery of the bright orange paint, uh, the seagull disappears after this page. He drops the paint and then moves on. I've always wondered, well, what, what um, was that seagull up to? Oh, that's Shasta. Thank you, uh, Syrah. That's Shasta. He sits up here with me, but later in the broadcast, he'll get impatient and uh, start pacing and demanding a walk. Um, I've always wondered what that seagull did. I got some... <laughs> I got this wonderful zine, A Guide to Goals by Claire Spiller. It tells you everything you want to know about goals, but not um, why they might be carrying a can of orange paint. So if you're ready, I'll, I'll share the story I wrote. Um, and we'll see, what we, we'll see what we learn. Ready? Ludlow Saves Christmas, written and illustrated by Gerald Connors. Actually, hang on. I don't, I don't sign my name that way when I'm on the show. Let me fix that. All right. Shasta is a good boy. I need to wet my whistle. Are we ready? Ludlow Saves Christmas, written and illustrated by good old Mr. Gerald. Ludlow Siegel's favorite day of the year was Christmas. It wasn't for the eggnog, it wasn't for the warm fires, it wasn't for the carols or the chestnuts. It was for the Medina's family, family Christmas picnic. For as long as Ludlow could remember, the Medina family ate their Christmas dinner on the beach at the far end of the boardwalk just past the cheese goober stand. They walked in line, each member of the family carrying part of an enormous feast. Grandma Medina would lay out her special blanket and soon bowls and jars of food would appear. The smell of warm spices filled the air. That smell enchanted Ludlow. It made the cold hot dogs and greasy pizza in the trash look like garbage. What's more, the smell awakened something in him. Maybe it was the memories of his ancestors migrating across vast seas to distant lands, or maybe it was an unusually fine sense of taste. Or maybe you're just picky, said a pigeon. Ludlow and the other birds often gathered at the cheese goober. The garbage cans there were always full of leftovers. Just close your eyes and gobble it down, said another pigeon, holding up a bright orange rubbery thing. It was called a cheese goober, and it was the pigeon's favorite food. No, thank you, said Ludlow. You don't know what you're missing, said the pigeons. Ludlow did not care to find out. Picky or not, Ludlow lived for the Medina's cooking. So when a tall man in a dark suit drove up to the beach in a fancy car and hammered a sign into the sand, Ludlow took notice. So did the two Medina kids. What do you mean no picnics? asked Safa. Sorry, kids, said the chauffeur. The beach has been booked for a private event. But we picnic here every Christmas, said Sonia. It's our tradition. Not this year, said the chauffeur. He climbed back into the car and drove off. 
Who does he think he is? Fumed Ludlow. Ludlow flew after the car. It led him across town to an enormous mansion. Ludlow landed near a window. Inside, a man sitting by a fireplace waited for the driver. Ah, James, said the man. Did you secure the beach for my Christmas morning run? Yes, sir, said James. Excellent, said the man. To celebrate Christmas Eve, I intend to eat an entire box of imported Scandinavian holiday cookies. I will want to exercise tomorrow, and a run on the beach sounds like an ideal way to burn those calories. Yes, sir, of course, sir, said James. Ludlow seethed with anger. That selfish jerk, he said, canceling the picnic just so he can feel better about eating all those fancy cookies. We'll see about that. Ludlow flew off with a plan in mind. If there's no Christmas cookies, there will be no Christmas run. Ludlow flew back to the beach and straight to the cheese goober stand. Next to it stood three cans of orange paint. Aha, said Ludlow, just what I was looking for. He grabbed a can of paint and flew off. But just as he passed over Main Street, the handle broke. Drats, said Ludlow. He flew back for a second can, but he hadn't gotten much farther than Main Street when this handle broke as well. Double drat, he said as the paint can fell onto a house below. Ludlow flew back for his third can of paint. Time was running out and he had one last chance to get his plan right. He gripped the can with his webbed feet, stretched his wings, and flapped with all his might. Ludlow made it to the mansion just as the Christmas lights were turning on. They lit up the roof and outlined the chimney like a target. Bombs away, said Ludlow, dropping the paint can into the sooty black chimney. Far below came a loud splut. Ludlow landed to give his tired wings a rest, but before he could congratulate himself on a perfectly executed plan, he got a terrible shock. A delivery truck was pulling up the driveway. Sorry I'm late, said the driver. I was crossing Main Street when a can of paint fell out of the sky. He handed the box of imported cookies to James. Say, Mac, what happened here? Ludlow's plan to ruin the cookies had failed. He flew back to the beach and settled in for the night. No Christmas Eve had ever felt so miserable. Ludlow tucked his head under his wing and fell asleep. The next morning, Chris Ludlow woke up and went to the garbage cans in search of breakfast. The pigeons were already there. Slim pickings today, they said. All the restaurants are closed. Just then, Ludlow heard the fancy car arrive. The rich man was getting ready for his run. He was bright orange from head to toe, <clears throat> but he looked as pleased as punch. Keep the car running, James, he said as he did the stretches. I'll be back in a few minutes. Ludlow got an idea. You know, fellas, he said, I think I'll try one of those delicious cheese goobers today. In fact, I see a big one right now. The hungry pigeons looked up. Cheese goober, they cried. Cheese goober! There was a wild flurry of grimy feathers as the pigeons took off after the orange runner. Goober, they hooted. Goober! James, get the door, the rich man yelled. The fancy car raced off, leaving orange paint and a broken sign in its wake. One last delivery to make, said Ludlow. Ludlow flew to the Medina's apartment and tapped on their window with his beak. Mama, said Sonia excitedly, I think the beach is open. Before long, the Medina family were gathered for their Christmas picnic. The aroma of the feast filled the air and Ludlow smiled. It would be a while before he'd get to sample the leftovers, but he was happy to wait. The end. Let's let's give Ludlow a Let's give Ludlow a happy ending. All right. And that's the story of how Ludlow saved Christmas and it um, answers the question, 
what that seagull is doing with that orange paint. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope, I hope you all enjoyed that story. Daryl, that's my present to you. Oh, actually, actually, um, if you see here, the dedication. Uh, Daniel Pinkwater's middle name is Manus, Daniel Manus Pinkwater, but it's also the name of my good friend, Daryl Michael Porcello, who, uh, Porcello, who was online last year, December 22nd, and actually helped me work my way through the story when I was uh, getting my legs, episode 42. So it works both ways. Um, Daniel Pinkwater and Daryl Porcello. There's your present. What an efficient way to dedicate books. Um, that's, that's not all, uh, but let's see. Would anyone, is anyone interested in seeing uh, some of the uh, work that went into that? Because I could, I could share that. Um, Ford, Ford's my moderator. Ford, if you could put the link to episode 42 into the chat, that would be great. What did Daryl miss? I'm not going over that. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I can, I, can, um, I can pull out some sketches for sure. Oh, hey, I know who this is. Hello, Mr. Gerald. It is I, the ghost of Dr. Zeus. It's the ghost of Dr. Zeus. He comes online to yell at me uh, from time to time. Yes, well, if by yell at you, you mean try to give you advice to make you a better author, then yes, maybe I yell at you a little. Mm, well. But if you prefer, I can always call someone else. I can maybe call Dan Sampat. I am sure there are many authors who would love to have the advice of the ghost of Dr. Zeus. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Zeus. I apologize. Yes, I appreciate okay. everything you do. Yes, well, I was just watching your episode, and I must say, the story you are using for inspiration has only the one splat. Yeah, it's the big orange splat. Perhaps you have heard of the book. Bartholomew and the Uble. Now, that is a book that is full of splats. It's says splat on the floor, and splat on the door, and splat on the window, and splat on the blindo, splat on the cat, and splat on the mat, and splat on the vingus, and splat on the dingus. The blingus and dingus. You get the idea. The idea being I use your books for inspiration. If you like, you know, or perhaps, uh, if not Bartholomew Cobbins, I have other characters you can use. Maybe, maybe the Lorax? If not the Lorax, maybe Tidwick. Tidwick? Yes, Tidwick the big-hearted moose. That guy does not get so much laugh anymore. Everyone's always going on about Horton. Well, people love elephants. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 they do. Uh, you have something else? Okay, and I have oh. another bone to pick with you. Another bone? Uh, what? I was watching your last episode, the one with the rhinoceros. Th that was a good one. I was very proud of that one, actually. Yes, and like... you forgot to tell your viewer something very important. Mr. Gerald, that was your 100th story you'd written on the story stream, and you failed to tell anyone that you had written 100 stories. Yeah, I don't always like talking You must about... do the self-promotion. I, I suppose you tell everybody about all the of work. Of course, you... I tell everyone about my story. I am the ghost of Dr. Zeus. Just yesterday, I was having lunch with my friend Van der Gag, and I told her all about my stories. Oh, what did she think? Eh, she was not impressed. Oh. You can't impress Van der Gag. She invented the two-page spread, you know. Mm, I, I, I learned that recently, actually. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, oh. now it is time. I must go. I am playing croquet with my good friends, Robert McCloskey and Joan of Arc. Thank you, Dr. Seuss. It's always great to see you. These are the final words of the ghost of Dr. Seuss. Yes. Goodbye. Goodbye. Wow. I can't believe what a, what a, what, what a treat. What, what a, it's a, it's a solstice miracle. The ghost of Dr. Seuss came for a visit. Um, definitely a treat. I, I can look at, I can let, let me check the time really quickly because 4.59, no, we missed it. All right, I had set up uh, this. Hold on one moment. I had set up this for us to catch the sunset outside as it took place, but you can see it's extremely overcast um, and there's no, no chance of us seeing the sun go down. So we'll return to this view. Um, and I will share maybe just a couple sketches before we say goodbye. I don't keep sketchbooks, which is probably a mistake. I just draw on loose leaf paper, but then I try to do my best and uh, compile them here. Oh, this is, this is from 
uh, the actual episode. This was... That day we pulled the words light, sand, stretch, and black, and we did some brainstorming. We had an idea of someone on a beach, uh, which turned into this drawing of this guy doing yoga on the beach and this surprise seagull. And then this appeared in my drawing. And then we just launched into it and we ended up writing the story. I'll tell you this, the, uh, the Medina family is based on some ex-students of mine. Um, uh, they were um, an Afghan family. And I like imagining that this feast is um, Afghan cuisine. But yeah, you can see some of the drawings here. You know, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna change my brightness for just a moment. It's getting darker by the minute. Whose bright idea was it to celebrate the night? I had a Rolls Royce. Uh, in my mind, the story took place, there's, there's the mansion. Uh, oh yeah, I had, I had the rich guy outside playing tennis. I was trying to think of the uh, trappings of a wealthy person. And then this was around the point, point where I had to add that later because I had to retrofit the story because it was around here when I colored that. You can see there's purple underneath, but then I was like, oh, wait a minute, this could be the orange paint. And then, splot, there's that. So that was, that was the original draft. That was what happened one year ago tomorrow. Uh, and then I took that and put it um, I created a PDF out of those sketches, added the words, and did a little bit of editing. But then the step after that was this. Uh, where I actually assembled it into a dummy. So this one I did just last week. And then the one we, we just shared together, I did I did about one hour ago. So, well, maybe, let's see, 502. Yeah, I did it. I did this one one hour ago, and that's the one I was very happy to share with you. Um, oh, I, I will share one more thing, because um, I did some work drawing seagulls, and I actually really like how these turned out. So I wanted to show you, as I'm trying to figure out, there's Ludlow and the Cheese Goober. Cooper. The Medina kids. I like this fox a lot. Still trying to figure it out. But where's the drawing I like most? Oh, this one here. I love that. I like that drawing a lot. And that's really all I had planned. It's so wonderful to see uh, everyone here today. And thank you very much for sharing this time with me. It's, it's a great uh, treat. Ford, I'd like you to do one more thing for me. Um, if any of you are interested in the Big Orange Splot, I encourage you to find it at your local libraries. But danielpinkwater.com, uh, there's a page there where the author narrates many of his own stories. So you can find that. Ford, please put the link um, to that in the chat, people can find it. Um, Ford is saying Sam Suds, which is his code for uh, pulling more stories out of the archives. Uh, I could, if anyone was interested, I could pull more stories out and share those with you. I have a big box of them. Uh, Syra, from this, from this, for this project, um, I wrote three days a week starting at 3.30 and writing for approximately one to two hours. I have never in my life or career um, practiced like a regular schedule. And it's, I always sort of, I was always a very fussy creator. I had to like create things, everything had to be just so. But with this project, uh, the story stream, I sit down and I write just no matter what for about two hours. And um, yeah, I do that three times a week. And it's been wonderful. 
Oh yeah, so um, so Ford has just pasted into the chat, uh, pinkwater.com slash audiobooks. audiobooks. Check that out, it's super good. I could share, I did mention um, talking about night and thinking about night. I have two other stories relevant tonight. One is called Moon Soup and the other is called um, Hope and the Darkness. And if anyone's in the mood for more stories, I could pull those out and read them right now. Otherwise, I'm also happy just to, to hang out for a bit. Oscar's interested. Thank you, Oscar. Um, there's Moon Soup. We'll tell you what, I'll grab both. Um, and then you get to see a little bit of how this works, too. I have over here. large box of books. Swap this out. I think that was episode 86 or episode 85. Oh. Yeah, here we go. Alright, there's Moon Soup. Moon soup. Okay, Brenna's asking for moon soup. <laughs> Oscar's saying cool, cool. Um, oh, by the way, I can introduce some people. Brenna, uh, the person who commented underneath you, that is Oscar. Oscar is the author of the story of the uh, balloon that came down in the lunchroom. Oscar, I shared your story with some people, or your reporting, that is. So I had one big box uh, full of stories. This is my second box full of stories. And I think this one was episode 125. Yeah, that's it. The <laughs> yeah, I'll share that story with everyone. Actually, here, you know what? I don't want to just... I have it right here. I'd like to share this with Oscar. Uh, may I have your permission to share the balloon story? If it's okay, type so in the chat and I'll, and I'll share this with everyone. Moon soup. All right. Uh, on that day, the random words we started were, were the random words we started with were oven, monster, catch, and minuscule. And this story goes, behind the oven lived a monster. He was made of dried up bits of ramen, old cereal, dog hair, and some leftover soup. His heart was a mustard seed which made him spicy. Whenever the family was cooking, the monster would glower from beneath the oven. He would snatch anything that fell on the floor. A quick, sw a quick swipe of a tentacle, a growl of mine, and the family knew they had seen the last of whatever it was they had dropped. But late at night, the monster was a bit less terrible. At night, the oven was only warm, not hot, and a breeze usually blew in from the kitchen window. On a particularly beautiful night, the monster crept out from under the oven. The world looks so different at night, the monster thought to itself. And then he saw it. A full moon hung in the air above the rooftops. Mine, whispered the monster. The monster was inspired by the moon. He wanted to get close enough to it to swipe a glowing moon rock. He picked up a pot and crawled to the door. Goodbye, he said to his oven. I don't know if I'll be back. 
Outside, the world was every bit as magical as the evening breezes had promised. The, monsters, the monster crawled along the pot, crawled along with the pot on his head. The moon, however, never appeared to get any closer. The monster's journey led him to a park. He made his way to a bridge where he saw the moon's reflection in the water. The moon looked as far away as ever. If I can't take a piece of the moon, the monster, said the monster, maybe I could scoop a piece of its reflection. The monster hung off the bridge and lowered his pot towards the water. At the last second, he lost his grip and he fell. The oven monster sunk into the water and looked up at the moon. It's even more beautiful from down here, he thought. But before he could start to swim for shore, a pair of strong arms lifted him out of the water. A spirit who lived under the bridge saw the whole thing and had pulled the oven monster out before his ramen could get soggy. You need to be careful on bridges, said the spirit. What were you trying to do? I was trying to scoop up the moon's reflection, said the monster as he climbed out of the pot. I guess it was a foolish thing to do. Oh, I wouldn't say that, said the spirit with a fiery laugh. In the pot, a perfect moon shined brightly. Now that you have the moon, what will you do with it? Asked the spirit. The monster didn't feel much like dragging the pot home. He looked at the pot and at the laughing spirit. He thought of his family's kitchen. Do you like soup? Asked the monster. The monster collected wild onions and rose apples while the spirit boiled the water in the pot. They made a soup and drank it and laughed far into the morning. The end. That's moon soup. I I haven't seen that when episode eighty three. I could pull that up. Ford, would you do me the kindness of uh, putting the link to episode eighty three into the chat, uh, and then we can find out when I wrote that. That was moon soup, and now. Moon scoop to Otis, moon soup to Otis scoop. This is a very, this is a true story. Mine are fiction. Uh, it's much harder to report things, not only report things accurately, but report things uh, uh, grippingly. And this, this story does just that. It says, it will be the best show in the history of Otis school. It will make me a star, says this Mylar balloon. NPR Balloon Comes Down by Oscar J. On December 5th, 2019, at about 12.30 p.m., a birthday balloon in the lunchroom, said to be there for 12 years, started to move in every direction possible. Everyone was pointing, yelling, and clapping about the balloon, finally floating around the room. The principal, on the other hand, was not happy about this, probably because of the noise. At one point, it looked like it was going to land on the principal's head, but it just floated over to the stage. One kid tried to get the balloon, but was told not to. In the end, Mr. Eddie, the custodian, took it down with one of those grabber thingies. That, that was a big day in our school community. That, that, um, that balloon had been there for years. Um, well, how are we feeling? Is it time to say goodnight? I almost don't want it to end. I think we will, though. If anybody, I know. Thank you, Ford. There is a small lag between me speaking and seeing what appears in your chat. So what I will do is this. Um, hope in the darkness. I have this fear that it's not as good as I remember. Tell us what you will do in 2022. Um, I can tell you this. Uh, I am ending this series. I consider 32 episodes to be a season. Uh, 32 is an auspicious number. Uh, my, my picture book friends will, will know this. 32 is an auspicious number in picture books. So I consider 32 episodes to be a season. Well, I, we're at episode 157, we're approaching 160. That's a multiple, uh, that's the 32 times five. That will be the end of our fifth season. I've decided to end the entire series at that point. You saw those two big boxes I have full of books. Um, I also have filing cabinets uh, full of stories. 
and I can't keep adding to them. So Daryl, to answer your question, what I'm doing in 2022, I will be taking a good number of these stories and giving them the Siegel treatment. I will be placing them into proper book forms. And yes, I will be taking those out. Ford is calling for Sam Suds. Ford, as much as I love Sam Suds, I'm thinking um, Hope in the Darkness. But as I was saying, I have, a, I have a small worry it's not as good as I remember. But it, I'm going to get something. If we do read, <laughs> if we do read, if we do read Hope in the Darkness, uh, Cupid dolls play a figure in it. At the time, I, I didn't know off the top of my head who invented Cupid dolls, but I did look it up to find out. They were invented by someone named Rose O'Neill. Uh, so if anyone wants to hear the story of, of uh, Cupid dolls, I can do that right now. Daryl is saying, finish them, sounds good, with, with nail polish emoji, finish them. All right, I will, I will. All right, let's do this. I'll, I'll stop hemming and hawing about it. Uh, this is Hope in the Darkness. Oh, wait, I need to... This story, I remember, took a long time, and these pages are actually out of whack. I'm just double-checking, because I actually think... Yeah, that's not it. Okay, hold on. So what happened? 123, 124. All right. Brenna wants to hear hope in the darkness. Thank you, Brenna. The thing is... Because I do these on the fly uh, and without preparation, in this case, I did two episodes before I decided the story wasn't working for me, so I rewrote it in the fifth, in the third episode, which should be 125 alone, which I should have somewhere around here. That's why that voice was telling me I wasn't quite ready to share it. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Um, this story started with the words monster light, hope, and infuriated and nervous. We did some sketching, and then this is the story we wrote. The monster under Nadine's bed was a nervous monster. Many things scared her, windstorms, the sound of tree branches scraping against windows, howling cats, but most of all, the dark. From Nadine's bed, Hope, that was the monster's name, could see the wind... <laughs> well, from Nadine's bed, Hope could see the window, and through the window, Hope could see the tops of buildings, street lights, headlights and the headlights of passing cars the ground glowed with a yellow light but above that was a black black sky and the thought of all that emptiness terrified hope hope grew so afraid of the dark that she began to feel it creeping into the room one night she decided she could bear it she couldn't bear it any longer That night, Hope reached out and took Nadine's iPad. She went online and ordered 24 glow-in-the-dark figurines. Better pick overnight shipping, whispered Hope as she tapped on the device. Early the next morning, the package arrived. Hope reached out Nadine's window and grabbed the box. Only the neighbor's cat noticed. I like that drawing. 
That night, Hope sat between two dozen glowing green babies. They cast a strange glow, and Hope felt they were all staring at her. This is almost as bad as the dark, said Hope, pushing a baby away from her face. Mama, squeaked the baby. Nadine looked under her bed. No, Nadine moved. Hope moved to the darkest corner and held her breath. As Nadine looked under her bed. Where did all these babies come from, said Nadine. Guess I'll clean them up in the morning. Hope frowned. Monsters are not supposed to be seen by humans. Hope knew she would have to leave the bed. She grabbed a few shoelaces, shoelaces and made a necklace out of the glowing dolls. Then, just past midnight, Hope stepped out from under the bed. She tiptoed carefully to the window and climbed outside into a nearby tree. Hope sat in the tree for a few moments, making sure the glowing dolls kept the darkness at bay. Well, may as well find my new home, she finally said. Hope began to walk her long strides, taking her far from her old home. Before long, she noticed some creatures following her. Oh, hello, fireflies, said Hope. The fireflies caught up and circled her necklace. That tickles, said Hope. But then some moths arrived, as well as a swarm of mosquitoes. Ah, cried Hope as she patui spat out a gnat. Too much, too much. Hope ran off. The swarm of bugs followed in pursuit. A croaking groups of frogs hopped behind. What do all these critters want, said Hope. Then she noticed her necklace. They're attracted to the light, said Hope. I need to get rid of it. She swallowed the necklace in one big gulp. Monsters can do that. And with the light extinguished, the bugs and frogs left. But the darkness returned. Hope closed her eyes tight. She felt the darkness around her. It was cool. It was calm. It was quiet. Slowly, Hope opened a single eye. The darkness came with more stars than Hope could count. The Milky Way shined brighter than all the glowing green babies in the world. It was the most beautiful thing Hope had ever seen. Hope leaned back on a log to admire the sky. You know, she said, I could get used to this. The end. Okay, I'm glad I pulled that out because it's a little fitting for uh, what I was saying earlier about night. To end, I would like to share a poem with everyone. Let's, uh, let's see if we can see anything outside. As we're thinking about days, uh, the passing of days and days and nights, uh, this is a poem called The Life of a Day by Tom Hennon. Like people or dogs, each day is unique and has its own personality quirks, which can easily be seen if you look closely. But there, but there are so few days as compared to people, not to mention dogs, that it would be surprising if a day were not a hundred times more interesting than most people. But usually they just pass, mostly unnoticed, unless they are wildly nice, like autumn ones full of red maple trees and hazy sunlight, or if they are grimly awful ones in a winter blizzard that kills the lost traveler and bunches of cattle. For some reason, we like to see days pass, even though most of us claim we don't want to reach our last one for a long time. We examine each day before us with barely a glance and say, no, this isn't one I've been looking for, and wait in a bored sort of way for the next when we are convinced our lives will start for real. Meanwhile, this day is going by perfectly well adjusted as some days are with the right amounts of sunlight and shade and a light breeze scented with a perfume made from the mixture of fallen apples, corn stubble, dry oak leaves, and the faint odor of last night's meandering skunk. Thank you so much for joining me today uh, to celebrate the winter solstice. I will be back for episode 158. So until then, uh, dear friends, take care and
be well. I'll see you soon. Bye for now. Thank you.